So our, our next speaker is Jeff McDonald from uh, the University of Saskatchewan. So Jeff, if you could unmute yourself and please share your screen. While, uh, while Jeff is getting himself set up, I'll just give a little bit of an introduction. Uh, so, uh, as I already mentioned, Jeff McDonald is um, currently with uh, the University of Saskatchewan. He is um, also the Associate Director of the Global Institute for Water S Security. Um, he has co-authored over 300 articles on watershed hydrology and co-edited the textbook Isotope Trace Tracers and Catchment Hydrology. Um, he is an elected fellow of the Geological Society of America and the American Geophysical Union. And um, he, in uh, 2016, was the winner of the International Hydrology Prize uh, Duge Medal from the uh, International Association of Hydrology. So a um, very, very prolific researcher, and we're very happy to have him here today. Uh, so he, Je Jeff, is your Thank mic you. on? Thank yes. you. All Thank right. You, Jennifer. Can you uh, see and hear me? I can, and we'll let you uh, let you speak. Okay. And I'll just one last reminder to the audience as uh, Jeff is uh, presenting, please uh, po post your questions so that we can uh, uh, go through them and, and have a conversation afterwards. Great, well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. What I wanna talk about is uh, really building on what Darko was saying about uh, water transfer within our suburban urban systems. And I wanna talk about how we can trace that. And we're going to put that in the context of the stable isotopes of hydrogen and oxygen. And of course, that's what makes up the water molecule. Um, sorry, my screen doesn't want to advance. There we go. I, before I do, I just want to mention that uh, I really appreciated the discussion last week about people's career paths. And I know many there are many students on the call wondering you know, how people got to where they got to in their career. I started off in geology at University of Toronto, and uh, it was my second summer. I was doing geophysics in the Yukon. I had so many bad grizzly bear encounters. I came back, changed my major, and I've been working in uh, you know less harsh environments ever since. It was just a, a bit too much for me. The the daily grizzly bear encounters are what seemed that way. So I think you know there's many reasons why we navigate careers like we do, and perhaps there'll be opportunity for discussion for that uh, later on. So what I'm going to talk about today are really two examples of how these isotope tracers that I'll define in a moment can be used for uh, urban stormwater uh, or even green space tracing. Um, and I spent some time with the Ryerson group uh, nine months ago, I think, and we talked about it even in the context of uh, rooftop gardens and the like. So I want to whet your appetite with this and get you thinking about how we could add perhaps additional things to our toolkits, whether you're a civil engineer or whether you're a, a landscape architect or horticulturalist even within an urban setting. So these are the this is the roadmap for the next uh, half hour or so. And we'll start off with a, a little bit of background on what these isotopes are and how they can be useful. And of course, with low impact development, Often what we're trying to do is this. So on the upper plot, you see rainfall in blue. On the x-axis is time, and this is a kind of a classic hydrograph that's discharge, and you're seeing some of the variations in response to that rain event. <clears throat> this is a, a nice study from South Korea and showing the impact of uh, low impact development on reducing that flow. So you see the hashed line, they've been able to reduce that, that flow by bringing in green infrastructure, bringing in low impact development. And this is great, but it's tough to kind of peer into that black box and understand where that water is coming from. And this is our big challenge. How do we take that hydrograph, again, one of these plots of discharge versus time, and understand its components? how it's created in terms of the, the timing of that rainfall or snowmelt event that's causing the, the peak and flow, and how it's affected by uh, in space, where that's coming from uh, in the watershed, in the urban or suburban watershed. This is still a grand challenge and we, we really lack tools for illuminating that black box. 
And I think this is where stable isotopes can be very helpful, both in a, a basic science way, but also in a way to uh, uh, evaluate our urban stormwater models, for instance. So what are these isotopes I'm talking about? They're the, the naturally occurring stable isotopes of oxygen and hydrogen. Uh, it's important to know that they're part of the water molecule. So they're added naturally during rainfall events and it's a conservative tracer and it's really becoming a much simpler thing to collect and to analyze for. So on the left, you see the traditional, you know, uh, water cycle and water balance. On the right, you're seeing the O18 composition of those waters, both in liquid and vapor form, that we can now measure for uh, less than $10 a sample if you have a, a laser analyzer in your lab. And I would, I, I, I'm sure there are many in the halls of University of Toronto and at universities uh, through the network here. So it's a very simple and straightforward measurement, particularly in the last years with the advent of uh, much newer technology for analysis. And we can talk about that later, but I don't want to get bogged down in that right now. But I think what it means is that increasingly we can use it to, again, look at the composition of the storm hydrograph, understand where the water is coming from, and provide some mechanistic insights into water cycling in our suburban and urban areas. So how does this work? Well, uh, one way is using a uh, simple mixing model. So here we have flow, maybe it's from a pipe, maybe it's in a stream, and we can separate that hydrograph. Again, just look at the graph on the y-axis is discharge, on the x-axis is time. But now we're trying to tease apart the two water fractions. Event water might be the rainfall, and pre-event water is, a, is the water that existed in that catchment prior to the event. And the equations are very straightforward. It's a two-component mixing model where you're sampling these different pieces, the stream water, the rainfall, the, the water that existed in the, in the stream or the detention pond prior to the event. And with very simple arithmetic, you're able to separate that hydrograph. Of course, it can become much more complex, but the idea is very straightforward. And I think this has uh, not been employed to the extent that it could in these kinds of questions that we're uh, interested in. We started out in this uh, area in the New York City watershed. I taught in the United States for 25 years or so before coming back to Canada. This was some work in the New York City watershed, uh, the Croton River Basin. And here we are using stable isotopes to try to understand the level of suburban development on changes in the hydrograph. I don't want to go into the, the gory details, but kind of more of a cartoon to to show you the kind of things you can do. So going from you know, lower density to higher density from left to right, these techniques can be useful to quantify those, those effects, for instance, of uh, impervious surfaces on generation of in increasing amounts of event water. Even though the shape of the hydrograph might be not too different, the actual internal composition of that hydrograph can be radically altered and this can be uh, you know, very helpful to know. Uh, certainly when you're applying a model like SWIM, and there are so many urban stormwater models, we used to work with uh, STORM and SLAM and uh, many, many four letter acronyms <laughs> for these uh, models. Uh, this is a paper that came out recently just showing uh, you know, R squared or uh, efficiency measures for the model in terms of its ability to replicate measurements. And this is often what we see. Again, rainfall in those kind of hanging bar graphs, runoff on the, on the y-axis and time on the x-axis, and those dots would be uh, uh, observations. And then the model, the simulation is that black line. But the thing we often don't look at or look at enough is what about the parameters that go into that model? What about their identifiability? What about their, 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 how meaningful they might be? And this is again where I think isotopes can be helpful because we can take a model like this and then we can look at the parameters and, those, and the efficiency of those parameters. So here we're looking now in parameter space. If you're a, 
a civil engineer, you're 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 maybe used to looking under the hood, as it were, of a of an urban stormwater model. Uh, M is a parameter for uh, shape of the decline of permeability with depth. Uh, the bottom right is uh, a, a, an effective hydraulic conductivity or permeability. Uh, the lower left is an initial saturation <coughs> parameter, and N is a porosity parameter. What this allows you to do now is to look at parameters based on whether or not they're reasonable from a hydrograph separation point of view. So the black dots are ones that are producing um, greater than 50% new water based on a hydrograph separation. The red dots are less than 50% new water. We know that this particular catchment never produced more than 50% new water. So those black dots are showing high efficiencies, but for the wrong reasons. Oops, let me just go back. So you're able to look at what are sensible or nonsensical parameters or parameter spaces. You're able to help see what you're wanting to do as well, of course, is to have identifiable parameters rather than just a shotgun along that distribution. So even uh, if you're a, a, an engineer thinking, gosh, how can isotopes be helpful to me? There are many examples in the literature that show that this can be a very useful diagnostic. And again, a very simple one to collect. The samples require no preservation. You just put it in a glass vial. They can sit on a shelf for a year, no problem. And they're now very easy to, to analyze and you can send them to labs or analyze them yourself. So it helps identify uh, parameter sets that produce perhaps the right answers for the wrong reasons. And this is very valuable when you go back then and look at your, your output, which uh, maybe gave you a high efficiency or R squared, but now you're able to dig in a bit and see, oof, maybe this is not meaningful in terms of what processes are going on in the, in the system. Okay, so that was the first uh, example. The second example I wanted to talk about was uh, stable isotopes for tracing tree water sources. And of course, this is a major challenge in urban areas uh, in Saskatchewan and in Saskatoon in particular. We have a lot of urban street tree die off. The reasons for that are many fold, but a lot of it comes down to water uh, relations. And I wanna talk about how these same techniques can be used in that context. So rather than sampling the stream, as it were, the, the actual stream, we're gonna sample the transpiration stream. So that little box you see on the tree on the left is where we can sample the xylem water that's moving up the, the stem of the tree. And we can do the similar two component mixing or sourcing of the water based on that catchment network, if you like, in the root system. So that's, that's now our, our source area. And we're going to be asking very similar kinds of questions. Where do the trees get their water? And uh, let's just uh, give you a little bit of background on this. Um, one of the early important papers was this one by Dawson and Elringer. This is one of the isotopes uh, that we talked about. It's an isotope of hydrogen, the heavy isotope of hydrogen. And this was a beautiful example of trees. They weren't street trees per se, but they were trees nonetheless. You see three species here. And on the y-axis is that isotope composition. And on the x-axis is tree diameter. And what they found was that for the young trees, the, the trees with the low, dia low diameter on the left, they were mostly using precipitation water. And as the trees got older, they switched to groundwater. And you can see this if you look at the isotope composition then on the right hand side of precipitation, stream water and groundwater. Boy, this set the world on fire. It was a nature paper and really got people thinking about the value and usefulness of stable isotopes for saying something about plant water uptake that was previously very difficult to get to grips with. Now, most of the work prior to about 10 years ago or so uh, used one or the other isotope. More recent work in the last 10 years has started to look at this in so-called dual isotope space. So now what I mean is we plot both isotopes against each other in this kind of plot. And you, this is now a way that uh, isotope hydrologists look at the world. So hydrogen on the y-axis, 
oxygen on the x-axis, always that way. And the waters that we would sample in uh, running waters and streams and uh, groundwater precipitation all fall on that solid black line. It's called the meteoric water line. And what we're finding in study after study now is that trees are often occupying a space, in, as you see in green, those green triangles. I know it's a shotgun of a lot of data, but those green triangles are the tree isotope data and those open circles are the soils data. And the open black ones are the shallowest soil and then back to where it touches the line, the deepest soil layers. This is telling us two things. One, that where the trees are getting their water in terms of the soil depth, but two, and maybe even more importantly, the trees aren't really using the mobile water that we see in the, in the runoff, in the streams and in groundwater. Almost like uh, two different water worlds for the vegetation and for our dynamics we see in the stream. We didn't really believe this at first. That first example came from a site in Oregon. Uh, then we did a global kind of meta-analysis. You see some of the sites in the map in the upper left. Uh, the, again, the groundwater, the stream flow from these many sites all fall on that, that line, the so-called meteoric water line that characterizes uh, all the precipitation that's kind of falling from the sky. If we looked at Toronto rainfall or, or snow melt, it would fall on that line. And I would bet most of your streams, unless they're undergoing some strange evaporation, would also fall on that line. But the water in soil and the water in plants uh, is plotting below that line. And that means it's a telltale sign of some kind of evaporative enrichment. And the idea is that the soils are undergoing evaporation and retaining the, the water uh, that is rather different in character to the more mobile water and the trees or the plants are going after that water in a way that really challenges our thinking about where plants get their water. Let me show you a cartoon just to maybe uh, try and explain it a bit further. It's got a little animation. I'm not sure if it'll work. What I'm saying is we have a rainfall event and that's the blue uh, dots that you see uh, kind of scrolling on the right hand side of the screen but the trees are uptaking water that's not necessarily that uh, water that occurred in the thunderstorm or one of those big events that Darko showed from uh, flooding in Toronto. It's using water that was pre-existing in the, in the soil. Going to the left then, these mobile waters are kind of hugging that meteoric water line and the, the plant soil water system is occupying a rather different space. We call this eco-hydrological separation, but I think it has important implications yet unstudied for uh, urban trees in terms of how they're taking up their water. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, uh, you know, the talk about er causes of urban tree decline are, uh, are, are discussed quite frequently. This is a, a, a paper. Uh, I'll just want to read a couple of sentences from the summary. Uh, urban trees can survive increased heat insect pests fairly well unless they are thirsty. Insufficient water not only harms the trees but allows other problems to have an outsized effect on trees in urban environments. So the big question is how do trees use the water you might give them and how does their their status, their plant water status, uh, how, th how you know their their level of thirst impact their uptake of water? This is a key management question. So I'm going to end with just one example. We've been studying this uh, in an artificial setting, of course. This is a beautiful lab. Uh, this is at EPFL in Lausanne, Switzerland. So at the kind of the Swiss Federal Institute, one of my PhD students has been uh, over there working. Here we have a tree and it's sitting in this uh, lysimeter, we call it. Basically, it's a big container. Imagine it like uh, the container you put a street tree in. Uh, this one though is sitting on load cells, so we can measure very accurately the loading and offloading, meaning loading when there's a rain event and offloading with transpiration. And it's filled with devices to make these measurements of soil water tension, water content. And of course, we added a, a labeled isotope to understand where the trees are getting their water. And we measured then the, 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 the 
stress of the tree with uh, dendrometer bands and also uh, devices internal to the tree. I won't go into details, but this lets you know something then of the tree and its status through time. So one, one kind of slide just to show the punchline uh, in terms of this uh, plant water status that you measure with that dendrometer band. This is some work of Magali Nahemi, a PhD student of mine at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, she's a CREATE funded student, a different CREATE program, but I think shows the, the value of the CREATE program in terms of facilitating exchanges that might not otherwise uh, occur. So CREATE is really a, a wonderful program. And of course, this one led by Jennifer is, uh, is, uh, is no different. So here on the y-axis, you see this uh, plant water deficit, basically how thirsty the tree is. And as, you, as we go through time, this is uh, covering a, a period of late spring into early summer for this lysimeter in Switzerland. What we're showing is how we go through no deficit, intermittent deficit, and then the trees are very thirsty as indicated by these, uh, these measurements. What we find with the tracer is that their use of water is changing. So it goes from a roughly co-equal blend of uh, deep water, uh, shallow water, and so-called mobile water, the, the water that does seep into our groundwater and streams, to now a very different blend when the tree starts to have a, a high water deficit, it's going after a certain water under certain conditions. So just to give you a sense of the things that maybe we can learn about our, our street trees, just like we're learning about our urban catchments in terms of where the water's coming from, uh, what water it is that is being used, and ultimately, I think the age of the water, the transit times, these are things that will really uh, hopefully open up the, the black box of our uh, suburban and urban uh, systems. So. Uh, just to wrap up, I guess I've, I've tried to show you uh, uh, some aspects of isotope tracing, how it can be useful, whether you're a, a civil engineer, a planner, uh, a landscape architect, in terms of some of the examples that could be used uh, for either basic understanding or, or, model, uh, or model testing. I think also it, it does relate too to the, the previous discussion about over design in urban systems. And this provides another window maybe into that question of, of over design and uh, maybe threshold activation of different parts of the urban system that can be uh, seen with stable isotopes. And then maybe the last slide I'll just mention is that um, my involvement with Jennifer and Liat and many of the, the group uh, under the CREATE program is through the this thing called the MOST facility. And this is a, a multi-purpose slope testing facility we have here at the University of Saskatchewan. And we're doing crazy things like uh, we've recreated exactly uh, the GRIT Labs green roof uh, test plots that, that Liette and, and Jennifer and others are, are using to test out different mixtures of soil and plants in a a more hostile setting like uh, Saskatchewan. Um, but the, the, the most facility, we do things outside and inside, we can do freezing experiments of hill slopes. Uh, we can look at, with our rainfall simulator, hill slope scale responses, and of course, using isotopes in that mix to try to help uh, solve problems and understand how systems are working. So if you're interested at all in any testing, we'd love to see you. Uh, we do work uh, in, a, in a kind of a fee-for-service nonprofit way, but we also welcome collaborators and students to come and, and use the facility that's funded by uh, Western Economic Diversification primarily, but also has you know, many other local uh, companies and communication uh, in communication with uh, Michael Malaro, for instance, who runs a uh, a landscape uh, er, uh, green roof company here in town. We work with him, O'Kane Consultants and others. Okay, Jennifer, I'll, I'll uh, leave it there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, uh, so that was great. That was We've great. got um, uh, questions, questions coming in. in. So our so first our one, one, and I think, I think this, this uh, would uh, a lot of people, lot of people 
would be a, sorry. Sorry, I'm just having a little bit of feedback. Okay, so our first question comes from Elizabeth, and I think probably a lot of people on the line um, who aren't necessarily uh, familiar with isotope measurements would be interested in this. Could you give us a little bit more just basic information about how isos isotope samples are collected and how then you actually determine the water source? Um, it, the, the examples you gave were, were really interesting, but um, for those of us that are not familiar, like how do you get the data? Um, <laughs> what does that actually look like? And then how do you actually process it? And I think you need to turn your mic back on. Can you hear me now? Okay, good. Uh, well, sampling, you're basically just dipping a water bottle into the stream or into uh, uh, a detention pond and then sealing it with a cap because really it's only evaporation that will affect your sample. Uh, so that could be manual sampling or you might have an ISCO uh, water sampler and you're doing automatic sampling, let's say through a urban storm hydrograph. Now, in terms of the analysis in the lab, this big change that happened after 2009 was the uh, invention of something called the laser spectrometer. And it means you no longer need a PhD in geochemistry to run a mass spec <laughs> or a mass spec lab. This puts isotopes in the hands of mere mortals like me and, and others because you have this uh, very simple instrument uh, that's under $100,000 uh, that can basically do this through calibration and standards in almost a bulletproof, ultra simple way. So we've trained high school teachers uh, and many people with different backgrounds to make these measurements. Now, plant water is more difficult because it involves, and soil water, because it involves some extraction, uh, some coaxing of water out of a matrix that's a little more complicated and, and uh, you know, admittedly, this is a, an active research area. How does the way you actually do the extraction affect the signature? But for the mobile water, it's as simple as uh, filling a vial, capping it, and sending it off to a lab if you're not, you know, working in a lab yourself. So these, this has become um, really increasingly common in, in most catchment studies outside of urban and suburban areas. But I think, uh, you know, in, there's increasing interest and, and, and real usefulness of these, these approaches. So following up on that question, uh, yeah. this is another question from Sean. Yeah. Don't individual storms have in like specific isotope signatures? Yeah. So can yeah. you trace water from individual storms um, yeah. in your hydrological inputs? Yeah, good question. So that's right. So we're relying on the fact that the, the rainfall event, that one storm, has a signature that is different to the water that existed in the system prior to that event. And when a storm happens, what, what's often used now is the actual signature of the rainfall through the storm. So rather than just a bulk sample of rainfall, we sample sequentially or incrementally through the rainfall, and there's a lot of signal in that input. Uh, I, I, bring up a slide for another presentation, but I'm I'm worried about uh, messing up our, our system here. But basically, th there's a lot of structure in the high frequency input signal, and that structure you can see expressed in a particularly a system that's producing a lot of overland flow due to uh, impervious surfaces. You can see how that's translated through the catchment, often in a very smooth and damped way. Now, that's the individual event. You can also sample over multiple events or just sampling, uh, say, weekly through time. And you can see that damping and lagging over longer time spans. And by doing that, you can say something about the age or the, the so-called transit time of water in your system. And that's a very powerful thing because that gives you a sense of I don't know, uh, sustainability, sensitivity, uh, is, is your water very old or very young? Uh, that can be 
quite powerful. We've worked in streams, for instance, that have, you know, waters as young as a few months on average to waters as old as several decades on average. And knowing that can be helpful. You know, is your water a blend of 100 year old groundwater uh, punctuated with uh, bursts of event water coming in? Uh, knowing that blend can really help you understand perhaps how things might be moving through your system below ground as well. One last thing I'll mention, uh, leaking pipes underground is a, is a chronic problem in many urban areas. I was lecturing at University of Texas at Austin and uh, there was a stream flowing through campus and students there had done a study, turned out that almost 100% of that flow had isotopic composition of uh, Austin tap water. Basically, these were leaking pipes on campus. So this can be another useful uh, tool for you know, that kind of uh, tracing as well. So a, a next question, actually, this is coming from Darko. <laughs> um, so roadside cells are becoming increasingly popular uh, stormwater management features. So does the current research actually indicate that trees do not benefit from the mobile water, i.e. like runoff water as much as we think? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question, Darko. Uh, boy, I don't think there's enough water, or enough uh, research to even hazard a guess at that. The, the work I've been talking about is really focused on natural settings and it's uh, exploded in terms of numbers of research groups doing analysis. But other than um, Claire Oswald, who you know at Ryerson, I, I know of very few people looking at this in urban settings. Uh, Dorte Tetzlaff and Chris Soulsby are doing some work in Berlin in urban settings, but uh, boy, uh, I think it'd be a, a, a fascinating and interesting research project. Uh, I mean, ultimately, there is use of that of the of the water because that's where the soil water is recharged, but it's the timing of that relative to plant water stress. That's the sixty-four thousand dollar question, and that's the the thing that's very tough to uh, to answer. But with some of Claire's work and Darko, you may well be involved with that. Um, I think there are some answers that are coming from some of the urban street trees on the Ryerson campus. Uh, I have another question here from Kanyin, which is also, I think, people are thinking about ideas of how they can use this um, this tool for, for research questions. Yeah. So how, uh, how do you think the practicality of using isotopes to track and quantify, or is it practical to use isotopes to track and quantify the contribution of LID techniques to base flow mm -hmm. in a given trackment? So I, there's been some literature on this, like sort of, looking at how LID is almost mimicking base flow releases um, in mm -hmm. urban environments. Do you think that's yeah. something we'd be able to actually quantify with uh, yeah. isotopes? It's a, it's a very good question. Um, you know, one thing that really sticks out like a sore thumb when you sample uh, urban stream water is any evaporation that's occurred, let's say in a detention pond, and that signal propagates, let's say, into the base flow system. I'm not really saying that too well. But uh, for instance, let's say you got a, a wetland or a pond and that water is undergoing evaporative enrichment. Basically, that water now, rather than plotting on that meteoric water line where most of your mobile waters are plotting, it's now plotting below the line. Boy, uh, IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna, an arm of the UN, are promoting this kind of uh, simple tool around the world where in developing countries we lack a lot of the hydrometric measurements necessary to say where water is moving. So just like the some of the simple tools they promote or ideas, if you have this evaporated water in a wetland, woof, you will see if it's recharging groundwater. You'll see it in stream water. Why? Because it's like this anomalous uh, signature plotting below the meteoric water line that shows up. And IAEA is using that to understand groundwater movement around lakes. So you can sample some uh, wells that you might put in around the lake and see very quickly 
which way groundwater is flowing, because if you see the evaporated lake water showing up in your well, then you know the groundwater is coming at you from, uh, from the lake water. So yes, uh, there are many, many kind of simple scenarios or techniques. Again, it's not giving you all the answers, but it's a way to uh, poke holes in arguments. It's a way to, uh, you know, evaluate a model and maybe reject certain parameters or model structures because it's just not uh, giving you something sensible from what the, in terms of the isotope evidence. So um, you can think of it as a screening tool as well. Yeah. Just, I want to make sure that um, that our, our audience also is, um, when you when you say evaporative enrichment, um, that everyone is kind of up to see what that means. And, and myself yeah. too, not being familiar with the this uh, this area. When you say evaporative uh, enrichments, you're referring to the fact that water that is undergoing evaporation process, some isotopes evaporate first and yeah. sooner. And so you're yeah. left with like the heavier ones, for example, or a certain type. And that's what then shows up as a tracer or as an indicator later. Is that correct? That's, that's right. I don't know if you can see my diagram <laughs> here, but uh, can you see that? Uh, well, I, I Sort of you're kind of? you're in little like little mode, right? Okay. We still have oh, the PowerPoint sorry. slide sorry. Uh, showing. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean uh, that's right. You you have uh, these. Think of these isotopes like uh, a, a big distillation process, and during distillation, the lighter isotopes rise and leave behind the heavier isotopes. So oxygen, for instance, has uh, O18 and O16. And the lighter isotope uh, rises into the vapor mode and leaves behind the heavier isotope. And what that means, and maybe this is what I was trying to draw on the, the diagram here, is it leaves behind a signature in that water. And for, say, evaporated water in a lake or a, a wetland, uh, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's plotting in a way that's different to uh, water that hasn't undergone that that evaporative change or enrichment. I'm using some fancy words here. So it's a, uh, I think it's something that uh, with a little bit of background, you can be armed and dangerous in terms of saying some some things about an urban system that then could motivate, you know, more study or rethinking of how your model, um, either a mental model or an actual uh, stormwater management model might be working. Okay, and so for our, our last question, our closing question um, comes from Samantha. And um, so just thinking about all this kind of information that we can get from, from isotope analysis, how could, for example, a landscape architect use this type of data to make design decisions or to evaluate or interpret uh, designs, uh, particularly living infrastructure designs? Uh-huh, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, it's probably more uh, after the fact, but it could be too with what we're learning about trees. It could give you some sense of uh, the type of water the trees are using that influences how you might set up or think about, you know, irrigation water and its uh, its link to, you know, creating a sustainable uh, urban garden or or a horticultural setting. Um, so yeah, I guess it's it's similar tools. It's it's giving you a sense of the water cycle at this kind of local scale, and that could be from a green roof box like uh, you and Liette are using, up to uh, something like a uh, you know a, a a a catchment in the in in uh, the Humber River or something like that. And I guess it's kind of thinking about your scale, your problem, and then developing a, a sampling technique that maybe lets you illuminate a little bit these these flow paths. And that's the big challenge with a lot of what we do is that we're not able to see into that hydrograph, whether it's a storm hydrograph or a, a tree transpiration hydrograph, if you like. So the getting at the, the sources and time components is really, I think, the, the area that the isotopes can offer some help. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, we just found the questions. I think uh, people found this really, really exciting and, and interesting. So wow. um, 
if everyone will just bear with us, we're going to switch to our one last slide before we close to the day, uh, just to go through what's coming up next week. Um, I'd like to say thank you again to Darko and Jeff for two very compelling and engaging presentations. Uh, a lot of exciting ideas for, for new directions and research in the, under the, the theme of living infrastructure. So um, uh, we should have the, our closing slide coming up in just a second. So next week for everyone on the line, make sure to come back because it's probably the most important week of the whole of the whole symposium. We've got four uh, four trainees from the Design Lives Network going to be giving uh, presentations on their research. So we've got uh, Sylvie Spackman, um, Abdul Halim, Tara Hicks, and Tamar. You know what? I apologize, Tamar. I should have checked your last name uh, before before going live. Tamar Amaleta, um, all talking about some of their research in uh, living infrastructure. And again, we'll make sure that we leave uh, ample time for discussions and questions. And um, uh, we'll be here again at 9 a.m. Uh, same time, same place. And thank you everyone again for, for joining us today. And I hope you have a wonderful Friday. So that's all for today. Bye. Thanks.